CCSs themselves, after you got connected, was not a terrible thing. They were amazing to use, and you could play games on them, just about anything, albeit not at the speeds, and certainly you didn't do YouTube on them. You could do everything you do on the internet right now with a BBS system. So keep, keep this in mind as, as we're talking about this. It, what we have now with one big central internet okay, is the ability to really, I think, catalog. It's, it's just it's far too easy to catalog everything we do. It's far too, and again, it is that central point of failure. Back then with the BBS, if the BBS goes down, you could just connect to another BBS. Most, especially metropolitan areas, like New York City, they have 30 BBSs. I mean, there'd be tons of them, and you could just switch around. You could just go to the next one. So if something fell down, you go to the next. It wasn't a big deal. And also, of course, at the time, uh, a lot of storing of information was done locally, which today wouldn't be a problem because, you know, uh, hard drives are cheap. I mean, you can get terabytes, terabytes upon terabytes upon terabytes for sometimes even less than $100. Okay? Okay. So what I want you to consider with the digital evolution is the idea that we have alternative technologies that we could use and that we could actually relocalize the internet to what it was before using new technologies that we have as far as available speeds. And then we don't have this central point of failure and we also don't have, you know, this, this just this huge overarching area where companies like Google can pretty much you know, figure out just about anything about you. Now, caveat with Google knowing everything about you, I think sometimes they fail pretty hard. Uh, they've never pushed an ad to me that actually sold me something that I wanted. Um, but I think we're seeing, we're seeing not, not in the digital space so much, but in meat space, I think we're seeing a lot of people starting to, I mean, how many people are enjoying Porkfest right now? Okay, everybody's enjoying Porkfest. How nice is it to be with actual people. Yeah. Okay, it, it's pretty great. I mean, does this pork, you know, would you rather be on Facebook than be at Porkfest? Anyone? No. Anyone? No, okay. I think we all inherently realize that the way the internet actually connects us is pretty superficial and maybe even antithetical to our own happiness. Okay, now I can take questions on that and you can ask me about that sort of stuff in a little bit. And I think a movement, a part of my opinion of what a digital evolution needs to head towards is relocalizing everything. The internet, take your pick, and just getting people together where they are and not being a replacement for our communication, but just being an enhancement, okay? Just making our lives better. I mean, I think there's a lot of people, no doubt about it, the way the internet lets you do business is phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's really incredible, you know, the, the businesses that you can create online with practically no money, and then you use services like Bitcoin, and, you know, they just free everything up. That's awesome. But I think you can create perhaps an even better business on a local level, or, you know, maybe we can figure out some way to, to somehow interconnect them a little bit, but either way, to relocalize everything as much as possible. I mentioned RetroShare earlier. It's friend to friend. Who else do you want to talk to? You know, when you're on the internet, I mean, <laughs> you know, you're trying to reach out. Well, friend of friends still let you do friend, of, you know, friend of friends. And so I, I think we're really missing something in, you know, my, my point is, is that I think a lot of people are getting very, very desensitized through the internet. And the internet, again, is a central point of failure to where we're going to lose entire aspects of what we do. And we're counting on it far too much putting far too much faith in something that is incredibly fragile. And the internet really is. Um, an alternative I want to bring up that uh, my other, the other host that was supposed to be here was, was going to talk about is MadeSafe, okay? And MadeSafe, if you're looking for a hybrid of what I'm talking about, is that we still have this nice big bad internet, but then we also have that decentralization uh, MadeSafe is really the answer to that. Now, how many people know what MadeSafe is? Okay, MadeSafe is an idea, it's a software platform, okay? Uh, kind of similar to RetroShare, not exactly. How many people know what Freenet is? Anybody? A couple. 
Okay, MadeSafe is a lot like Freenet, except the difference with free the difference between MadeSafe and Freenet is one has an incentivization system. It, it incentivizes you to to work within it through uh, uh, its built-in cryptocurrency called SafeCoin, obviously from the name MadeSafe. MadeSafe is is a, it's software you would install on your computer, and once you install it on the computer, you give it so much hard drive, you give it so much CPU usage, you give it resources. Okay and then you get access and it creates an entire other internet. But the beauty about this internet is it does not run on servers. It runs on everybody's computer that has it on there. Okay, and what's that? So, so it's like BitTorrent, it's like sharing a file. It's kind of like BitTorrent, but here's, yeah. Yeah, but here's the beauty of it is that not all the data that ever gets put up is, in ever, is ever in one place. Right. As to where BitTorrent, part of the problem is, and where like legal issues occur, people can... Seeding. Yeah, seeding. Uh, they, they know who's got it. Yeah, you've got the whole movie. As to where you put a movie in the made safe, that movie's everywhere. But you can access it just as fast as if it was in one place. So it's like Usenet in a way, but it's actually like centralized with like some sort of crypto. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like Usenet. Usenet's pretty, pretty basic software. Um, that, that actually should, I wish people still used, um, but that's another, getting on to Usenet costs way too much. It used to, Usenet is sort of an email alternative to some degree, and it's actually really popular for downloading files. Uh, you know, it's an alternative to torrenting, uh, but Usenet, you have to pay into companies now. It used to be free in the 90s, it just came with your ISP service, uh, but that's, that's no longer the case. So I don't usually talk about Usenet just because of that. That doesn't mean it's not useful, it, it's very useful. Uh, so MadeSafe is this decentralized, no server internet, connects everybody everywhere around the world. It's really amazing. It does not exist yet. It's not out there yet. But it's coming. Okay, it, it is on its way. They, they are funded. They did a pre-sale for the safe coin that I mentioned. Okay, and, and so it does exist. So MadeSafe is something I definitely recommend looking into, especially if you are a miner for cryptocurrencies and suddenly your computer's are worth really running to mine cryptocurrencies because you can become a farmer, kind of like you have server farms, yeah. okay? That's what we, like we talked about earlier, those central points of failure. Well, with MadeSafe, you become a farmer, and so you're actually you know, kind of working it, and you get safe coins in return. So you're incentivized to have this internet run, and it has nothing to do with the government uh, because unfortunately, whether I like it or not, the government did invent the internet as we know it. That doesn't make it a bad thing in and of itself, but, uh, but that's a fact. I know there's a lot of libertarians that want to say, oh, no, no, we created the internet. We certainly brought it to where it is, but we didn't come up with that technology. Um, what's that? I wouldn't even say we brought it to what it is now. Yeah, maybe not, maybe not. I think banks actually really like made it what it is. Yeah. <laughs> porn. Yeah, porn makes that. Actually, great point about porn. I'm, I'm going to open this up to, to questions, what people want to do. Um, because my, my whole key, though, is just I want people to start thinking a little more locally and just having all of these digital, all these technologies that we have enhance your life and not become the primary aspect of your interactions and your business and what you do. Okay, that, that's my main key. But with porn, uh, porn actually has continually, or sex, I should say, has continually driven science and technology forward since the beginning of time. Uh, there's, there's no doubt about it, whether it was the first, uh, you know, male that needed a, a bigger cave to fit uh, all of his sexual partners, be that men and women, uh, you know, it, that, that was the, you know, what is it, the, uh, the mother of invention is necessity, right? So, sure, sure, yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, honestly, and I think just about everything is, like, its end game goal is to have sex. But that's genetic determinism in science, so I'm not even going to get into that. Uh, let's do questions. How about that? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the fact that uh, a lot of the core philosophy is being lost behind the internet. The, the original intention was that it allowed existence to emerge in our environment without a spatial reference. Now, I'd like you to tell us, if you can, how one can support, given that, how one can support the Tor network by running an exit node. Because we talked about that, you talked about the, the centralization of servers. Everyone's a server now. Mm -hmm. So we've gone from a originally a client-rich environment where you have root access to the hardware that you've got. You're getting that less now with fancy hardware like this. 
we've moved into a server-rich environment and we're now coming out of that phase. And too many young people only know how to use computers at the application layer. They know how to use it from a software point of view, but they don't know how it works underneath, and that's what we're lacking. So perhaps as a first step, you could tell us how we could support the Tor network by running an exit node. Okay, awesome question. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, using the, there's actually there's a website right now uh, called Tor Challenge, and actually I think it's eff.org slash Tor Challenge, and there they will tell you how to set up Tor as an exit node. Now, because Tor is so important, remember I, I told you and I gave you real life examples of how Tor is literally saving people's lives and it's actually creating the freedom that we're all here trying to achieve. Okay, so it's very important whether or not we want the digital evolution to take us from a not so centralized internet or not, Tor is a huge deal. Okay, so you can check out that website to see how all that gets set up, but I want to put in the caveat, you're going to install software and when you become an exit node, like uh, Chris mentioned, okay, when you become an exit node, you become the IP address, essentially, that whatever action was being done or whatever action is being tried by the person who is accessing the Tor network, like you, 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 uh, will, will be the one that, you know, that you'll be taking, essentially, in our modern world, you will be taking responsibility for that. Some countries are harsh about that, others are not. It's always case-by-case -case basis. Setting up as an exit relay, you be, again, like I said, you become that ability. And if, if we don't have a bunch of exit relays, the Tor network doesn't exist. You have to have an exit, you have to have exit relays. Okay, so the more people, the better. And my argument for this, yes, it's absolutely, it is, there is a degree of danger in being an exit relay, okay? Because you can fall under some kind of legal issue. But the more people that do it, I mean, it's, it's the, the oldest saying in the book, right? They can't lock up everybody. You know, and that's it. It becomes a, a comedy of the commons, okay? To where, you know, the more people that do it, uh, yeah, I mean, what can they do, eventually? So I think that's important. Now, the philosophy of the internet, that's, that's a pretty interesting subject. Um, I mean, my, myself, I think the, the, I don't know what the, I'm not sure if the original philosophy of the, or, are you saying the original philosophy of the internet is that it was to create something out of nothing? Is that, no. is that the idea? Go no, ahead. Yeah. So Tim Berners-Lee often talks about the URI and the Universal Resource Indicator, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that the idea is that everything has a number and that it can be sourced somehow. The problem at the moment isn't so much that that's happening, it's the problem is that only a few people control it. So I'm not objecting to Facebook and Google and the categorization of the world's information, I'm objecting to the people that uh, claim dominion over it and claim control. Everyone should be able to claim control. I should be able to set up my own internet. Right. My computer should have everything it needs to establish its own interconnected network. That's all the internet is. It's just a network that makes other networks into meta networks. Right? So it liberates everything that it penetrates. Sure. Okay, yeah. I agree um, that, yeah, I mean, I think the, what the internet did, whether or not it's, initial, it's its initial philosophy, is the internet literally freed up information once and for all. It finally said, nope, here it is, you can't stop. It increases the marginal cost of keeping it private. Right, yeah, it increases the marginal cost of keeping it private, absolutely. Um, and so th what is the danger of that? Well, the danger is, is that you do have uh, people that not the, the danger isn't the categorization of all these things but it's the danger of what people can do with it uh, and that's a real problem and so I think increasing the marginal cost of the ability to control that network would be part of the case that I'm making here in that we need to decentralize that uh, to, to achieve that that aim because I mean you know it's it's so easy right now for anyone to just access just about anything about you because it's all on one big, you know, one big splotch. And you could say, well, then let's just take out the servers. And I'd say, yeah, exactly. Let's take out the servers. Let's all go client side, like Chris was saying, where we're all running, you know, made safe or retro share or whatever it ends up being, or we start doing new uh, BBSs once again. Um, other questions? Backbone routers were never intended to back. Backbone routers? Yeah, we never intended. Explain backbone routers for. Well, what you've seen over time is, is an increase in centralization of the network that, you know, constitutes the Internet itself. And whereas, you know, uh, you know uh, it used to be in the beginning, you had 
uh, universities that you know would uh, provide hosting and connect to the internet and it was just it was a bunch of smaller computers all connecting one another and now it's you've, you've got these huge backbone routers where if you take out a couple of them then you could potentially take down the entire internet and what it was designed to be was a system that you know would be impervious to something like a thermonuclear nuclear attack Right, uh, ARPANET is the kind of the original internet, and the purpose of that was to survive a nuclear war. Um, and so, you know, it, it's ironic because the internet in and of itself, like we've described, is a very fragile thing, but it was actually designed to not be fragile at all. Uh, but that's but that's what happens when, uh, when government gets really gets involved. Next question. Uh, just on the subject of Tor and the exit notes. I just want to say they're developing a Tor coin so that you would be paid for running an exit node. So there could be some monetary possibilities there, so check it out. Yeah, this is a really new development. Uh, I think Ars Technica just did a story on it maybe a week and a half ago. Um, and it is Tor coin, and the idea is to, much like SafeCoin for MadeSafe, it is to incentivize being an exit relay, the, to incentivize the use of Tor. Um, I think that's fantastic. People can get into the arguments about the economics of creating a coin out of nothing. That's a whole other ballgame. Uh, the bottom line is, is that yeah, that, that's that's a great point to bring up. That there is, there will be perhaps in the future incentives to use some of these encryption technologies. I was wondering if you could comment on uh, MeshNet and BarkNet and other uh, technologies that allow people to connect in the way the internet was like originally intended, instead of like how it currently is. Okay, mesh networking. Um, this is something I was debating on whether or not getting into, but mesh networking is uh, that's another very freeing technology that exists out there. Mesh networking is essentially you you know you have five devices and they all connect to each other based on the fact that they're literally connecting to each other and they can completely interact with each other. All five devices can interact with each other. Now, some of the ways mesh networking is is a very big tent term. Okay because mesh networking can mean the ability to have a bunch of devices daisy chain off of each other and one of those, one or two of those devices has access to the big bad internet or it can just mean creating your own network. Okay, uh, this is something that's being heavily worked on. There's Open Garden that already allows for this functionality. It is closed source, keep that in mind. Okay, but don't fall for the closed source fallacy. Don't, you know, I mean, there's, there's two points to the closed source fallacy. One is, is that because if it's open source, it's good. But then the other side of that is just because it's not open source doesn't mean that it's bad, okay? Uh, so keep that in mind. Open Garden allows for that to happen. It allows for the internet connection, say on your Android device, it does not work for iOS, say on your Android device, uh, it will, through Bluetooth and perhaps Wi-Fi Direct, will allow your Windows or OS X, no Linux, Windows or OS X machine to connect to the, to the data connection of your phone. It will also allow a whole ton of um, Android devices to connect to each other. It's, it's really, really exciting stuff. Uh, also, the same company, Open Garden, actually has what's called FireChat, which was, ironically, originally designed on iOS. Um, and it allows, for it allows for you to chat with people without an internet connection. They just, they just attach via Bluetooth or Wi-Fi Direct or, or whichever on your devices. Um, but since we got other questions, or I was just going to comment on FireChat. I think that is... Yeah, sorry. Um, I think on FireChat, that made use of Apple adding like this... MCF. Yeah, yeah. The mul mul you know, mul making multiple Wi-Fi connections and doing like local ad hoc stuff and chatting over that, I believe. Yeah, that was that was kind of a unique. That's why it was first done on iOS, is because iOS has iOS software has this what's called multi-peer connectivity framework, and this is important because, in my opinion, this is just my opinion and speculation, but I think this mesh networking is actually the path that that Apple is going. They are going to interconnect devices completely through this MCF, through this multi-peer connectivity framework. So mesh networking is something that's being taken very seriously by some of the biggest companies in the world. Uh, it's a great thing, and it's definitely part of what I was talking about where we need to kind of relocalize um, our digital lives. So mesh networking would allow for that. Uh, other questions? Otherwise, I've got something else I want to mention. Yeah, um, I've got one question. I mean, we talked a lot about localization, but I, I think, I mean, there is a value 
to like the long tail communities that have been able to exist via a wide internet too. So that's not to be like discounted either, I would think. Yeah, I, I think you're right. There are advantages, certainly. I mean, definitely on, on an entrepreneurial end, I think it's pretty easy to make a case for how great that is. Uh, what I think should occur, though, is in the decentralization of all the things, you want, you don't want that to be the center, that long haul internet, you don't want that to be the, the, the centerpiece of your digital life. You don't want everything available right there, but maybe some degree of interconnectivity between, uh, between various internets, and I'm not saying that like a, a, you know, someone who doesn't understand it, I'm using the literal term, uh, internets that, that would allow them to, to communicate in some way, but, but to definitely take that away from the center stage, but that, that's a good point. Um, the last point I just want to make is that we mentioned Apple and Google and the, the directions they're going. The, all the, a lot of these big companies are very much, I mean, whether we kind of decentralize the internet or not, I think a lot of these big companies are going to do it themselves. They are in, if it's not in a literal sense, at least in a code sense, they are going to create, they are already doing this. They're making their ecosystems the only things you can use. Okay, Google is creating an entire ecosystem where you can do everything you possibly want to do, but you only use Google services. Microsoft is doing the same thing. Apple is doing the same thing. And my concern in that is that all of, the, all of those abilities are being centered around uh, mobile devices, phones, tablets. You take your pick. And so a lot of the things we talk about that we can do right now or that we want to do in the future, in my opinion, are not going to be possible via smartphone. At least smartphones that run on Android and iOS anyway. Okay? And so another point of this kind of relocalization is I recommend perhaps just a little bit every day in your life, get away from those mobile devices a little bit and count more maybe on your laptop because your laptop just has so many abilities. All the stuff we talked about you can completely do on your laptop. And I mean, really, like what, how annoying is it to just constantly get those notifications, notifications, notifications? I mean, are you even living? Yeah. I, think, I think a lot of people, I bet if we went around Porkfest, a lot of people would be saying, well, you know, actually, not having this internet's pretty damn good. And, you know, they're, they're actually enjoying themselves or they're paying attention to people for once, whatever the case may be. So I do recommend laying off of a lot of the issues that are going on right now as far as privacy and security are very much intertwined with mobile device usage, particularly Android and iOS. Uh, so look more towards your laptops because everything that you want as far as privacy and security already exists there. Uh, and they can't take it away from you. As to where on iOS and Android, oh yeah, we don't like this app. And they'll just yank it off your device. You have no control. So anyway, that's, that's it. Thank you.